Um, tonight, you know what? God kind of put it on my heart. Uh, a little different story, a little different way. Um, like, that's God, right? Um, so I, I'm going to share to you. It meant a lot to me, and hopefully it will to you as well. So um, uh, we'll see what God does with it. So um, it actually started from, I started looking at books. So I, um, I'm trying to go through and read some of the classics and those kind of things, and, and I enjoy listening to books on Audible. Um, and so there I came across a list of, uh, I think my wife actually did, for 100 books every man should read. So and the very first thing I was looking at, I was looking through some of the classics and stuff I've already read before and that kind of thing. And one really caught my eye because it wasn't like, it wasn't the normal kind of a book. It's actually like a self-help book that was written like in 1930. So, um, and I was like, okay, that's interesting, you know, and uh, why, is, why is this on this list, you know? Never heard of this guy, never heard of this book before, and uh, so I'm like, and it was short, so I'm like, I can, I can handle that. So um, uh, anyways, it was How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but I sure haven't um, until now, and it was written by Dale Carnegie, and uh, so... There's a whole story behind it, but uh, I'm going to kind of talk to you tonight because all truth is God's truth. And uh, interesting, as I was listening to the book and some of the things that God has done with it, just by me using these, these concepts or whatever that actually aren't new because they're already in our Bible. So um, these are already things that God has already used and has told us to use a long time ago, thousands of years ago, you know, um, it's just we don't often do a, a real good job of using them, you know. Um, us as Christians, we should be some of the best people to win friends and influence people simply because we have, if we're following, we have the love of Christ. Um, I would say, I don't know about you, but I think Christ did a pretty good job of uh, winning friends not so much winning friends. He made a lot of enemies, too. I understand that. But influencing people, um, he's the most influential person of, and changed history more than anyone else has in the entire world. So I think he did a pretty good job of influencing people. So and if we are supposed to model Christ, well, then we should be some of the best influencers, right? You know, it's interesting because on, on uh, I don't really get into this, the whole social, social media thing and they have influencers out there, right? And uh, I don't follow a single one, and and because uh, I think most of them are absolutely ridiculous. But you know, but they make lots of they make their money by doing it, you know, and they and they influence people in all kind of horrible ways. <laughs> um, and some of them good, I get that. But you know, um, that's not what called Christ called us to do. He called us to influence for good. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that tonight. Um, so anyways, let's, uh, let's go to Lord in prayer. God, we just come to you tonight, and God, I pray, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that you just meet us here in this place. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill this room. Lord, that you would use your word to speak to us, God. Lord, that it would be, um, speak to our hearts, Lord, of how we are to love others. And so, God, I, I pray, Lord, Lord, that you would just use this time for your glory. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Um, so the man who wrote this book, his name's Dale Carnegie. Um, and uh, he wrote this book and a few of assistants, and they went back for years and before the Internet, um, obviously, and uh, poured through libraries all over the world, put it, pulling together um, famous people, um, people who influenced up to that time, generals, leaders, world people, um, and kind of distilled all of that into what are some of the tr what are some of the things that they did to influence people, to to win friends, to use, so they kind of distilled that all into a few things, um, and so um, he wrote a book on it. And then he also did this whole, he did like a, you know, kind of like a self-help seminar thing for business, mainly for business people, um, way back before self-help was popular, you know? Um, and so, but he wrote this book on it. And so, um, and you're probably wondering, you know, why, why in the heck should I be talking about that tonight? You know, 
I'm not a business person, I'm not this, I'm not that. Well, as I already kind of alluded to, you should be an influencer. You should be winning friends because how else are you going to tell somebody about Christ? How else are you going to have them hear you, have them listen to you um, if we don't do that? Yes, it's the Holy Spirit, obviously, the Holy Spirit working through us, but you know we're tools, and uh, we should be well-oiled tools. We should be sharpened tools. We should be ready to be used by God. So, um, you know, Matthew 18 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the, Holy, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So go, therefore, obviously, and make disciples, right? We're supposed to go out into the world and meet people, influence them, talk with them. So, right? So uh, that's what we're commanded to do. Um, so it's interesting, as we went through this, my wife actually read the book, and then one of my sons read the book, and we actually had this little um, text group. <clears throat> and we kind of text every once in a while with different little concepts we used, like, to how, how we've used it to, to in our lives um, to, for different uh, meeting people and that kind of a thing. Um, my son's doing an internship at, at Camelback Inn, and uh, he used it to talk to a few to different people up there and uh, um, used it to, to uh, just talk with people, find out about their life. You know, it, one, one couple was you know, jet setting the world, whatever, and they were so impressed by him and, and that kind of and that kind of thing, him talking to them that, you know, they, they wanted to, you know, talk to not only his manager, but talk to their manager manager and, and, and those kinds of things. And so um, uh, he's done lots of other things that he's seen from it. My, my wife has, uh, she went and talked to uh, somebody who's trying to get my son Caleb a job. He's only 14. And so, um, not too many people are going to give him a job, right? And so she was at Water Ice Coolidge, just started talking, and, he, and the owner, she met the owner there, and he and started talking to him just a little bit, and he's like, nah, we don't really hire or whatever. And so part of the thing is just, just talking and letting people and letting people tell their story, letting people talk and, and hearing them out. Um, and so after, what, a half an hour or whatever, he's like, you know what, tell your son to come in here, and he's got a job. <laughs> um you know, just things like that. I, I have uh, on the board. I run a cotton gin, and I have a board that I that uh, that I that I that uh, um, I'm res responsible for and responsible to. Excuse me. Um, and one of the board members, when I started on, never liked me. He he, he never liked me at all. Um, and uh, it's a long story, but um, he called me out to his farm, and uh, there are some other issues with business that he wanted to talk about, and. And uh, we, we talked about that, and it went pretty well and, and that kind of a thing. And so one thing he, he brought up, you know, he's like, you know, thing, there's something that really just bothers me that you do. And I said, okay, well, what is it? Um, he's like, you, you, you have this Bible verse on the end of your, all your emails, and that just really bothers me that you do that. You know, because we shouldn't, you know, that's probably turning other people off to, to come into our gin if they see that kind of a thing. And so I'm like, okay. So I just started talking with him, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, letting him speak and uh, kind of, you know, using his points, not getting offended by it, just kind of talking with him about it and uh, make a long story short. By the end of our conversation, I ended up, getting, ended up going, get, being able to uh, tell him about Christ and, uh, um, and, and, and talking for about half an hour about it, um, you know, and... Uh, didn't quite get get to the point of uh, that, but at least I got my foot in the door, you know. And talk about turning things around from being almost hostile to to listening to me. And by the time I was done with that and telling him about Christ, he, you know, he's like, I really appreciate our conversation. And he's like, you know what? I was wrong about you on this board. He's like, I really appreciate you being on this board. It was just those kinds of things. And it, it really comes down to to that. Um, and And so... Number one, the, the, there's a many different aspects of the book, but I just kind of, obviously, the book is like a seven-hour listen to, and I don't think you must sit here for seven hours. So, um, and the book is nothing special. It's not, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's just, it's, just a, it's just a guideline, basically. It's good reminders, you know, as, as us as Christians. 
<coughs> and some good practical advice, let's just put it that way. Um, so there's nothing exactly special about the book, but um, the number one thing I got is the first thing in the book is if you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. So don't criticize, condemn, and complain. You know, um, we often are quick to do that, right? We're often quick to complain or criticize or, or whatever. Uh, believe me, I got, I got a number of teenagers at home, and they're very quick to complain. You know, we're bored. Where are this? Where are that? You know, so they're really good about that. Um, but Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know, the, like I said before, the, these concepts of the books are nothing new. Sol Solomon talked about these, you know, uh, thousands of years ago. Um, how should we approach brothers and sisters in Christ, or non-believers for that way, for that matter? Um, how should we do it? What are we trying to accomplish, and what is our heart? You know, I, I think before we have a conversation, when someone's asking us about Christ, or maybe maybe we're we're coming to them. Maybe they're not even asking that, but it's kind of our intention of of speaking about Christ. But where's your heart? You know, that's the first thing you need to check in yourself is where's your heart in, your, in this conversation? Um, is, it to, um, is it to win an argument? Is it to prove that I'm right? Is it to, um, well, I'm really getting some Jesus in you. You know, I'm just going to do it. Um, or is it I'm, I, I'm, I have something out of love I'm coming to you to tell you about? Um, you know, it's interesting, people are, are, or you may speak to someone as they're, that you see screwing up, right? You see someone and you're like, wow, they're really messing up, so I'm, I'm going to give them, I'm going to really give them a piece of my mind. You know, I'm really going to tell them something. People don't listen to that. People will turn you away. People will turn to death. They don't, they turn you off. They're not going to hear you. President Lincoln was very critical and judgmental of others in his younger years. Um, he was so critical and judgmental that he, he uh, with, a fo with a fellow politician early in his life, um, he made one so angry that he challenged him to a duel to the death. Um, and Lincoln couldn't get out of it because, you know, there was all about honor and that kind of thing. Luckily, God intervened, um, and so the duel didn't actually happen. And thank the Lord that, you know, he didn't have to kill anyone and he didn't get killed. Um, but he learned a lot that day. He learned a lot of, of how he was talking to other people and criticizing other people. So our future president, who led our country through the darkest days of our Civil War, um, who had talk about having to bring people together, talk about having to not criticize and not do and not bring this t torn, awful country torn apart by the awful thing of slavery, how do you bring that back together? You could point fingers, you could complain, you could, you could condemn people a lot. But he had to try to bring the country back together, had to try to fight a war to, to do all those things. Um, he, learned, he learned the right way to lead people by, by bringing people along, not by condemning or ripping them apart. Um, you know, Christ does the same with us. Christ draws us to repentance. He not by ridicule or by force or by, um, you know, tearing us down, right? Um, he brings us along gently, you know. Yes, our sin is pointed out. Yes, our sin, because of consequences, hurts. But it's not Christ pointing his big finger at us, you know, um, the consequences of our sin have a way of doing that all of itself, okay? Um, you need to remember that you're, you're not in it to, to, to win an argument. You're trying to save the person because you love them. You're, you're not trying to force them. You're not trying to, um, I'm really going to get them. It's where's your heart? How are you going to love them to... Love them to the right way. Love them repentance. Love them away from their sin. Um, but you have, to, you have to be careful in the way in which you do it because people, for the most part, are not logical. Okay? 
We're not logical and immediately. We're often emotional and prideful. So when you go at somebody as um, you're doing wrong and I'm going to prove it to you, okay, they're, they're immediately going to close themselves off to you and you've already lost the argument. you already lost what you're trying to do. Okay? You need to come to them with love like Christ does with us. Um, the big secret in dealing with people, you, uh, you can never make anyone do anything. Okay? We need to make them want to do it. As you talk to somebody, you're never going to make anybody do anything. You have to make them want to do it. Romans 6.16 says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? And then Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may, be cons- you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, we're not going to make them do it, okay? We need to, to show them, lead them there to make them want to do it, okay? Often, how is it going to happen, okay? The book doesn't go into that because they, it's not a Christian book. How are you going to do it? Well, transforming of the mind. Holy Spirit, pray for that person. Pray for them, even in the midst of a conversation. Believe me, when, I, when that board member came to me, I started praying immediately. I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. And uh, so I started praying, like, God, help me to say the right things, you know, to do the right deal, to, to, uh, because I wanted to turn this around and actually share the gospel with them, you know, to turn this around. And, and the Holy Spirit did, you know. Um, but there's also ways we can, we can go about it. Um, one is praise others and let them know they are appreciated. Um, I know this is very simple, but we often don't do this. Um, you often just go along in life, right? And we don't really go out of way to praise people. But we all want to be appreciated. That's deep down within us. We all want to be appreciated because everybody wants to be, feel important. It's amazing. I never quite looked at it this way. That's the one thing I got out of this book more than anything else. Everybody wants to feel important. And as I looked at it all different ways, it's, it's exactly right. You know, it's a motivating factor. They want to feel important. So, and it's interesting as I was thinking about this, tied it back to um, a marriage class my wife and I teach called Love and Respect. And Love and Respect, it's, uh, it's based off from, for those of you who don't know, it's based off Ephesians 5.33 that says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So there's two different ways. There's the love and respect are two different ways to help them feel important. A wife wants to be loved, and a husband wants to be respected. And both of those ways are ways in which they feel important. So it's, it's a long way. Yes, a husband wants to be loved, and a wife wants to be respected too. But we're talking about overall, we're talking about... Um, in, in, in the arching, the, the wife really wants the, her main thing is she wants to be loved, and the main thing the, the husband wants to be respected. A man wants to be respected. And so in, in this class, it talks about it's their oxygen. It's their, you know, it, it, makes, it makes them breathe. It makes them to uh, inhale and exhale because that's what they live off from. You know, it's, it's that feeling of importance. And uh, in speaking within the marriage, you know, it's, it's speaking in when, you, when, you, when a wife shows respect to her husband, He's like all about it and makes him, wow, my wife respects me and I really appreciate that, you know, and, or, or, oh, my husband loves me and, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Um, it's, it's what motivates people. It, what motivates, because that's the way God designed us, you know. Um, 
we're, we're looking for that. You know, it's interesting. We, uh, wife got me a dog for um, my birthday. And uh, so my wife was like, well, I want a dog, but I really want to train, okay? And I grew up, all I ever had is, um, grew up on a dairy farm, and all we ever had was farm dogs. So, you know, you throw them outside, and they follow you around the farm, you know, but you don't really train them anything. You know, they just kind of live outside, and they're a good pet, you know. But she wanted one to come inside the house, and she really wanted to train. And I'm like, okay. So uh, my wife being, uh, you know, OCD with detailed everything, <laughs> um, looked up different ways to train dogs. And I must say, you know, it, it's worked quite well because the dog's pretty amazing. But what is interesting about it is you train with giving the dog a treat. So, yes, we have the collar, the shock collar. If it gets real bad, you do it, but you hardly ever do it. You know, you hardly ever do it. It's, it's, all, with the, it's all with its food. We use it food as a treat for the, so when it does something, you say yes and, and reward it and give it a little bit of food. You know, all through the day, you do this, you know. It's inter what's interesting about that is, is that, and you see that, you think of like, uh, I don't know, you think of like SeaWorld, you know, and they got these great big huge animals and, and killer whales and all that kind of stuff, and they're training these huge animals by giving them a little bit of smelly fish, right? And you see them do that all the time, you know. Um, it's always by reward. Well, what's our reward? What, what motivates us? Well, it's to feel important, you know. Um, it's a feeling of importance that we can give out to others. What, is it, what does it really cost us to, to give that to somebody? It doesn't cost you anything. You know, it costs you talking a little bit, right? It costs you putting yourself out there a little bit to say something nice about somebody, to say something encouraging to somebody. Um, and I'm not talking about flattery. I'm talking about, you know, because flattery is just is, uh, you trying to manipulate somebody, right? You're telling them all what they think they want to hear and all that kind of stuff. It's a, that's a different motivational heart. Okay, I'm talking about sincere appreciation. You know, how important it would be for us as other people in our lives or just random strangers, you know, to, for us to really think about what is it what I appreciate about this person? You know, would it, it, would it really be that hard? Maybe it just takes to look at them a little bit. You know, look at the person. What's, what can you appreciate about them? Um, there's probably something. I don't know. Maybe something they're wearing. Maybe they got, you know, uh, it's funny. We're, as we were coming over here, we stopped at Chick-fil-A. My wife was, the girl was taking an order, and she, was, she had these uh, pineapple earrings. And she's like, I really like your pineapple earrings. And she got all, you know. And you can just see it on people's faces, you know, that simple compliments like that just make them feel good, you know. I mean, we all know this because we all like it, right? When it happens to us, we're kind of like, oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. I appreciate that, right? But why, so why is it we can't do it to others? Why is it we so fail to do it to others? Um, you know, it is said that 90% of the time, this is sad, but 90% of the time we think of ourselves in our own world. But... What if we think about the other person and who they are? I bet we could come up with a lot we could appreciate about other people or something about them, you know, if we studied them a little bit, right? Um, if we went out of our way to tell others about something we appreciate about them, would it really cost us much? Nope. Would it be that hard? Not really. Could it be an inroad to have a conversation with somebody? that uh, to, to, you know, and, and this book mainly is, is about business-wise for business dealings and those kinds of things and working with people and that kind of thing. But I'm thinking about this as bigger, you know, obviously, as I'm talking to you. I'm thinking about, so if we can become friends and influence these people or just say something nice or, or whatever else, how much more can we, we show Christ with them, right? Um, I think Pastor Pat says one time about um, leaving a track or something at the dinner table, you know, make sure you give them a good tip, you know, because <laughs> otherwise don't bother leaving the track. I think you were the one who said that. I don't remember, but, um, and that's so true, right? Because, well, what kind of, how are you really showing them you really appreciate them if you leave them like a dime or something, you know? Yeah, it's like, really? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, 
you're never going to get, unless you, it's, it's like the appreciation that you're putting yourself out there talking to that person, you're opening that person's door to get to their heart, right? That's, that's, the, that's the key. That is, that is the, uh, the ticket, so to speak. That doesn't cost us anything to the person's heart, right? And us, right? Christ is using us to speak to them. So, it, could Christ do it all by himself? He sure could, you know. But for some strange reason, he uses, you know, uh, worthless, you know, horrible people like us, okay, <laughs> that uh, fumble and fall and fall, you know, all the time. He uses us to speak to people, right? So, if he's given us that high calling of responsibility, shouldn't we spend a little bit of time figuring that one out? All right, uh, number two, what, what, what do people want, right? I, I, just went, um, I just went on a fishing trip uh, uh, in the, uh, on Black River up on the Indian Reservation. And uh, before I went, I'm asking my son, you know, hey, what kind of bait do we need to get, right? Um, what do we need to get because what do they caught? And then we get there, and we, there's like three different kinds to kind of use, and we end up using crawdads because those are really bringing them in, you know. And, uh, but... We can figure that out for fish, right? For fishing. You know, we got to figure out what they want, right? What's the good to bring them in? You know, if it was what I wanted, I'd be throwing them ice cream out there, right? But I'm probably not going to be catching too many fish throwing ice cream out there, okay? But that's what I want. So, but why aren't we, you know, duh, why aren't we doing that with other people? What do they want? You know, what, what is it that's going to speak to them? You know, it's not about what speaks to us. Maybe it's something, I don't know, maybe it's not even in our wheelhouse. Maybe it's something that they, their job they do or whatever else, you know. But if you have an honest appreciation for something they do, for something in their life, for their interests or whatever else, you know, that's a way to reach people where they're at. It's a way to get them because it's a, it's a way to, to talk with them. Um, Arouse and one of the things you you want to do. The book talks about is arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world before him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Okay, if you figure out what it is that piques somebody's interest, right, gets them what's their what's what's their bait. You know what what it is that that's going to to get them to, li to listen to you, to talk with you, to, to go forward, you know. We could probably figure it out fairly even, fairly, fairly easily, okay. Um, some of you may, it's been a little bit longer than others, okay, but remember back to the dating years, okay, all right. Um, when, you go, when you go on a date, right, well, you're hopefully, because you're probably not going to be on a date very long if you're not, but hopefully you think about, you know, maybe where they want to eat or maybe what movie they want to see or, you know, I want to, you know, dress up. Maybe I kind of look presentable for them, right? And then we get married and forget about it all, right? But, no. <laughs> but um, why isn't, if it's important enough to, we know this, right? It's important to do the date because we want to impress them. We want to to know this because they want to um, see that we have an interest in them. Well, why don't we do that with, our, with just normal people? Shouldn't we have an interest in everybody? Isn't everybody out there God's children that need to know Christ in this fallen world? So isn't everyone out there, shouldn't we be putting ourselves out there to, to use that, to use that influence to talk to other people? Um, you know, again, Christ is using us, so why don't we try to figure out the, what, what, what's going to attract them? What, what, what's going to, uh, what's the bait that's going to, uh, for those person to talk to? You know, um, what kind of appreciative thing can I say? What kind of, how can I talk with them? How can I talk with their interests? Maybe whatever. Um, my dad, um, we used to go on hikes um, when I was a kid, and uh, these long hikes, and he would hike fast, right? And so... Um, us kids, what we wanted was to stop, okay? 
So, you know, and we're, Dad, come on. And he'd be like, oh, we got to keep going, we got to keep going, you know. So what we finally figured out was what Dad likes is he likes to tell about stuff to us kids, right? History or something about the plants or whatever. So we'd be walking along, hey, Dad, look at that rock. That's pretty interesting. What is that? And we're like, he's, well, he'd stop and start talking to him. Like, we're like, it's water, you know, get a drink, you know, whatever. So it's that, right? It's. What is what? What motivated him? What what talked to him to get you know what we want too? Okay, but what we want we should be we as Christians should want to share the love of Christ. Okay, but how do we how do we do that? What what how do we we need to find out what motivates that person? We need to find out what interests that person to be able to connect with them, to be able to have that um, earn that right to speak to them. Um, be a good listener. Uh, people want to be heard, right? Like my wife just simply was well, that business owner, and he went and just talking. All, all she did was listen to him about him and his business and what he did, and that kind of, she probably got two words in it otherwise, right? But people want to be heard. Why? Because they want to, people want to be important. They want to be listened to. They want to be heard. They want to, they want to know that other people care, you know? And so... We should be good listeners. James 1.19 says, Know this, my, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Okay? You know the old adage, you got two ears, one mouth? You know, use it that way. You know, but how often do we do that, right? You know, ask questions and then listen. You know, um, it's, not, it's, it's not all that hard. Okay? If you, talk, if you talk about yourself all the time, it's all about you, right? It's all about me. But being an, att an, att an attentive listener means you care about the person you're speaking with. You know, make the person feel important. Make them feel engaged. I had this dairyman friend who is a really nice guy, but I'd go up and talk with him, and he would be constantly like, hey, Ethan, how are you doing? He'd sit there, and then pretty soon it's like this. As I'm talking to him, it's like he's looking for someone else in the room to go talk to. You know, it's like, hello, I'm right here. You know, um, I'm not important enough for you. You know, you're looking for the next best thing. You know, or, you know, when you're in a conversation with somebody and they're talking and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, well, but my, and then all of a sudden you go off about your life or whatever else. You know, just shush, listen. You know, engage those person. Just ask some simple questions. Engage them. Really, you can learn something, people. We can all learn something from each other, you know. Um, and so engage that person. Be an attentive listener. Um, we can often, same way, you can, you can stave off an argument or diffuse situation often simple, simply by listening. You know, as you have, sometimes people come at you, and boy, they're upset, and they're all, you know, like that telling you the board member, he's, he was kind of upset and that kind of a thing. I just listened for a long time, you know, to him and, and listened to what he, what he had to say. And, 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 and I agreed with him with some points that maybe he had a point, you know. And then I kind of turned, the, turned the, the conversation a little bit, you know, to help him see things my way. And it was very effective, you know. Um, he just wanted to be heard. You know, so often people are like that. They want to be heard, especially when they get mo not... You know, probably about 80% of the time when someone's upset about something, it's because they want to be heard, okay? They're upset about whatever else, and, and they may not even know the full story, right? they they not knowing because Matthew 18, right? Matthew, Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother, right? Matthew 18. And I can just tell, I'll tell you this right now, people, okay? I'm on a few different boards, and I'm on a few different things, okay? Christian ones, mind you, okay? Matthew 18 principle is not used very often in the Christian church, unfortunately, okay? It should be, but it's not, okay? Because we're, we, why? Because we are emotional, and we're prideful people, Okay? And we get hurt or we get something else and we blow up and it gets spread all over instead of going to that person and talk with them about it. And, and just being good listeners, half the time you can defuse the situation. Okay? 
Um, it also works in reverse. If you go to your brother and just listen to whatever they have uh, against you, it could also end in a quiet dispute. Okay? Don't necessarily put it on the other person. Okay? Maybe if there's an issue there, maybe just go right up to them. To them. You know, and to say, hey, John, hey, Sally, whatever, you know, it looks like you're upset with me. I heard you're upset, whatever. Can we talk about this? I mean, confront them about it. That just nips that little talking behind people's back right down, right? Because we're going right to them. Okay, then they have to explain. And maybe they're going to say, well, you did this, this, and this, this. Maybe some of that's true. Maybe, maybe you have to say, or maybe you just have to you know, say, oh, well, I didn't mean it that way, or whatever else. You know, we, we have to be, good. again, we have to be attentive listeners. Okay, and we have to have the love of Christ in, this, in, that, in that situation. Okay, and pray like mad when you're in it. <laughs> you know, let the Holy Spirit speak. But these are important things to be able to, to function as a church, as Christian brothers and sisters. Um, all right, how to make people like you. Um, find something you admire in someone else, okay? Acts 13, 22 through 23, Paul in Athens, okay? In the midst of, uh, I don't know, it's Areopagus, I don't know if I said that right, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What, therefore, you worship is as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And then he goes on and tells him about Christ. He, I imagine Paul walking around in Athens, right? And there's a men of the, the city that sitting up there, and they would debate like Socrates back and forth with each other, and they're very religious people. And he's, I imagine Paul, I don't know, this, this is me, but he's walking around and he's thinking to himself, okay, how can I, how can I get it in with these people? How can I get it in with these men? How can I talk with them? How can I show something? And he finds an unknown guy. He goes to him and says, I see you're very religious. He admires them, right? There's something he finds that he can admire them about. And so all of a sudden now he's got their attention. We can do that with people all day long. We can honestly find something we admire about someone else, okay, and tell them about it. And then talk about, you know, so immediately that's going to get a person's attention. They're going to be like, oh, well, thank you. And they might go off talking about what you admire them about, right, or talking about this or that or whatever else, okay. These are just simple things of showing love to somebody. You know, it all distills back to that. You know, hopefully when you're in love with somebody, okay, you're going to tell them something that you admire about them. We do this for, in our family, we do this for our birthdays. Um, we go around the table, and so all the, everybody has to take a turn and tell one thing they admire about the person who's having the birthday. And then when we get to the end, we go all the way around, and the last person whose birthday it is, they have to say something they admire about themselves. And... Uh, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's possible <laughs> to find some, you know, as, as maybe the person's hard to get along with. Maybe the person here thinks, there's just nothing to admire about this person at all. Well, are you really looking? Or are you being blinded by your hatred? Blinded by whatever else, okay? Take those glasses off, put on the glasses of Christ, what he loves and love, and find out what you love about them. Find something that you can admire about them. Okay? Everyone has something. Okay? Um, you know, Luke 6, 31 says, And as you wish that others would do to you, do so also to them. We all wish, okay, we all like when something, somebody says something good about us, something to admire, something whatever else. Okay, if we like it, why aren't we doing it to others? Um, you know, in leading others at work, um, I am uh, a general manager of the gin, and uh, I've got a number of guys that work for me. And uh, it's amazing how well it works as I walk by and, and finding some, hey, I really admire, I really like what you're doing here, or whatever, you did a really good job, whatever else. You say that to them, and then maybe you have to even say something, but you, you know, 
something else to them. But it's amazing you, they stop and they're like, oh, thanks. Also, now you got a captive audience. Now, also now you got their attention. Um, and they can also soften the blow sometimes for things that you, you have to say that maybe aren't so nice, okay? Maybe you have to say what, it, you know, but I, over here, I, know, I don't know what's going on with this work over here, right? Okay? But if you just immediately come up and say, oh, what the heck are you doing? You're just an awful employee and you're just horrible and you're, you, they're not going to hear anything. They're going to say, what a jerk, you know? You know, I don't even want to hear from this guy. You know, then every time that you walk in the door, they're like, oh, here he comes again. You know, and then they're talking about, no, you need to come with them in a different way, okay? You can say things that uh, aren't always nice, but we can do it lovingly. <clears throat> in uh, John, um, John 8, the woman caught in adultery. In verse 3, it says, The scribes um, and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, the woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote his finger in, uh, on the ground. Okay, I've, I've always wanted to know what Jesus wrote. <laughs> um, maybe I'm going to ask him that in heaven. So I'm just always curious. Um, as, they as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So did Christ come with just absolute con condemnation for this woman? No, the Pharisees did, right? They're going to stone her. You know, they, they were coming right at her. But Christ came to her defense, right? Against the condemnation. But if you'll notice at the end, he says, go and sin no more. So he didn't say, go ahead and keep on sin and do what you're ever doing. I just love you. You know, so much the world right now says, you know, allow me to do whatever I want, and that's love. Well, that's not real meaning of love. <laughs> you know, if someone is doing something wrong, the loving thing is to tell them, hey, you're doing it wrong. But how are we doing that? How are we saying that? How are we bringing that up to them? That's how we need to think through that process. That's how we need, we need to do it in love as well, not just point the finger and get, at them, get after them. Okay? We need to come with them with love. Um, find, <clears throat> number five, find areas in which you agree before you talk about areas you don't. Okay? I kind of talked about this a little bit, but it's a, a yes, yes. They talk about this in the book. It's a yes, yes. So you find, when you come to something and you, and you don't agree about something, you know you're going to bring that up, you try to find an area they do agree, you know. Try to do this like with the kids, you know. So, you know, understand that. And, and uh, so you want to find some common ground there so for them to say, well, yes. You know, did, did you... Did you um, you know, whatever, a kid breaks something, right? And you come to them and you say, so, um, is that broken? Yes. <laughs> you know, is that good that it's broken? Or uh, not, sorry, that'd be a no, but I'm, um, just other ways of having them say, get them to say yes, okay? So you get them on your side, right? You find the common ground of commonality before you talk about the areas in which you disagree. Okay, um, Timothy two, Second Timothy two twenty three says, "Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels." Okay, 
don't go out there and jump into something and uh, just dumb things and get an argument, okay? That does nothing. It does nothing for anyone, okay? Is there ways that you can talk to people even when you don't agree? Yes. We need to know this in, in society right now, people. We're so <clears throat> divided right now as a country. We're so divided out there, right? Okay? But how do we talk to those people who are way on the other side, okay, who are, who are steeped in sin and doing what they're, how are we ever going to reach them? Well, we're going to have to reach them through the love of Christ, right? We're going to have to find, come to bring them to ourselves, not just condemnation, not just pointing the fingers, not just um, pointing out how awful and bad they are. That's not going to do anything. You know, if, if that's just, if that's your heart, you know, you, yeah, you may win, you may win with facts, but you're not going to win their heart. And that's what our, that's what our goal should be. Um, number six is you can't, you can't win an argument. Um, always av avoid the acute angle, meaning that the sharp angle, the, the sharpness, avoid that. Because um, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still, okay? If you're just trying to convince the person how bad they are, you may convince them, but in their heart of hearts, they're not changed because it, they become uh, the pride, the pride prideful, right? And they're going to stop and they're going to say, well, I don't really care what they have to say. I'm not going to listen to them, okay? Proverbs 17, 14 says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out, okay? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a debate with someone on something of substance. I'm not talking about ridiculous debates. I'm talking about something of substance. Um, but just know you mostly, most likely will not really, won't really win them, okay, even if you feel he won the debate, all right? Remember, we will most likely not win them to Christ, uh, but we could gently lead them there. We come with them with love. Okay. William Lane Craig is is a is a famous one of the uh, debater right now. He's kind of the, the hot one who wins a lot of these debates with some of the, the well known atheists and that kind of a thing. But something he said really struck me, and that is, I debate with the other person, but I never think that I'm going to convince the person I'm debating of anything, because I probably won't do it. I'm really speaking to the audience. So. I'm not saying we shouldn't have debates, but just know what you're doing, okay? If we're, if we're sitting there talking to somebody, okay, are we really doing a debate? <laughs> what are we doing it for? You know, to win a, just to win the argument? If we're doing it in a debate setting, then we should be doing it for others to show them that there's some merit or whatever else to what we're talking about. Facts and figures come up fine. But if you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation or just a couple of different people, is a debate really the, the place for that? No. Okay? You need to find ways to bring them to Christ gently. All right? Ways to bring I'm not saying shy away from the truth, but doing in a loving manner. All right? Um, one way we can do this is if you're wrong, be quick to own it. Um, there's this whole book written um, called Extreme Ownership. It's written by a Navy SEAL, uh, Jacko uh, Willick. Uh, it's very good, by the way. So another one I, I, I'll uh, preach to you about. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a whole thing of, uh, of owning your mistakes. Uh, Proverbs 18.12 says, Before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Be humble enough to admit mistakes mistakes draws others to you, okay? When you're getting an argument with somebody, say, you know, come to them and say, um, you know, I may be mistaken here, but this is the way I see it, you know? Um, I may have an issue here. It disarms people who are ready to prove you wrong because if someone comes up to you and says, well, you know, and they're, you did this, this, and, you're thinking, and you say, well, maybe I did. Let's, let's look at it. Well, immediately they're like, oh, <laughs> oh, he may, yeah, you know, because they're ready to fight, right? You know, and if you're, 
come just to disarm them and says, well, you know what, I, I might be wrong. Because you know what, you might be wrong. <laughs> you know? Um, Peter 5.5 5 says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud, and I don't want to be on the opposition of God. Um, Theodore Roosevelt said if he could be right 75% of the time, he would reach his highest expectations. So here's a man who did quite a bit with his life, right? And he's saying if he can be right 75% of the time. So obviously 25% of the time he's wrong, right? Do we admit that we're wrong 25% of the time? Probably not. Okay. Okay. Um, but, all right, if you're willing to say, I might be, I might be wrong in a situation, I want to look at it, I, you know, um, willing to at least be humble enough to see it. I, I had, again, in my story at the gym when I first started, um, I had a general manager that I took over for who did not like me at all. And, uh, I came into a meeting one day and, um, Two of, my, two of the board members were sitting there, and he was sitting with a stack of papers, and they got brought in, and, and, it was, uh, and I was going to be grilled. Because he said, well, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, and this, and, 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 and you know, I could have got all upset, blown up, and just walked out of the place and said, I can't believe you're doing this to me. You know, this, you're, you're, um, you're coming at me from all over the place, and I don't know anything about it. But I simply, I'm like, okay, God, I need your help here, because I don't even know what to say. So I uh, just sat down and started saying, well, I may be wrong. And I did point out the problems. And I, I was, before I even got to the point, I knew where he was going. There was a couple of things I did do wrong. So I pointed those out immediately. I said, I did do this and this wrong. And I said, but I don't know what else he has to say. So long story short, he had the stack, right, of the stuff. And I'm like, where is he going with all this? He had nothing to say. He had this big old stack of stuff, and, you know, and by the time you know, he pointed out, he pointed out one or two other things, which weren't even my, you know, mistakes. And, and I just said those, and I kind of walked through it, and pretty soon at the end of the meeting, it was like, wow, well, wow, well, we just need to watch what you're doing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you're going to make mistakes. We all do. Own it. Own your mistakes, Okay. If we're humble people, that's what we should be doing. That's what God is calling us to do is be humble people. So admit when you screwed up. Learn from it and try not to do it again. Um, all right. A sure way to make enemies is try to prove somebody wrong. Uh, do you know someone who is always right and everyone else is wrong? You know anybody like that? Um, do you enjoy being around them? No. Who does, Right? We don't like being around those people. Benjamin Franklin, when he was younger, said that uh, he enjoyed winning in arguments uh, quite a lot. So a friend of his, a Quaker friend of his, said, uh, came aside and told him um, that his friends didn't even like it when he was around. Um, he was told that he was told that he knew so much that no man can tell you anything. Instead. No man would even try because it would lead him to so much discomfort. So you are very likely to know no more than you do now, which is very little. That stuck with him, and he changed. And he had admitted that, you know, came apart the way he would talk with people and, and the way he disarmed people and, and end up being a great statesman and a great politician to help save our country. Um, Luke 14, 11 says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Not sometimes. You will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. Okay? Step out do it. It doesn't feel good. I'm not telling you it feels good to admit you're wrong, right? Especially in front of others. Down here. Let me skip down here. Um, oh, let the other person save face. You're in an argument. Let the other, don't jump on somebody and just drive them into the ground, right? When they mess up, when they, whatever. Allow them to save face. 
Allow them a way, way out. Um, we're all going to make mistakes. Have some compassion, people. Have some compassion for others. Okay? Are you, where's your heart? Is your heart just to win or is your heart to, for that person because you love them and you want to come alongside them? Okay? Allow them uh, to come out of it. Proverbs 27, 21 says, The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold. A man is tested by his praise. So use your praise judiciously, okay? Use your praise for that person. Come alongside them. Yeah, they screwed up. Yeah, allow them to save face, okay? In conclusion, in, in the last, um, Heidelberg Catechism sums up the purpose um, for what we are created for, along with what Christ said the greatest commandment was, to love God and to love others. That's why we are created. That's the whole re the reason why we exist is to love God and love others. It's interesting that the Ten Commandments, the first ten are all about God, the last five are, or last, sorry, the first five are all about God, and the last, last five are about others. And it's all about those two things, how we love God and how we love others. The concept of this book, of the, what I talked tonight, okay, is three things. Humble yourself, okay, and love and respect others. And you can influence and win friends, okay? You can draw people to Christ. St study other people. Find out how you can come alongside them. Find out what it is that you can make them feel important about. Because we all want to feel important. We all want to be loved. We all want to be respected. If we work to understand our brother and how he wants to be treated, we are showing him the love of Christ that we are called to, and we earn the chance to share Christ with them. That is the bottom line of what we should be doing okay? as a church. We should be finding a way on how we can to come alongside other people, love them, and enter a chance to share, them, share Christ with them or walk in life with them. We're all going to have problems. We're all going to have issues. Okay, We're all going to be wrong sometimes. How are we as people coming along to love others, to speak into their lives, to encourage people, to lift them up, to influence them, and to win friends? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I just, uh, God, I thank you, Lord, for this time. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us as, as people, Lord, to look at our own hearts, to look, Lord, at how, Lord, we can look to others to love them, to speak with them, to change the way in which we relate to others. God, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would point out in our own hearts of how we can be judgmental of how we can be uh, quick to put others down, um, maybe not lead with the heart that we should. I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to see the ways, the strategies, Lord, of speaking to others, of showing them love, of showing them importance, Lord. I just pray this in your name. Amen.